ideological, but they were intensely nationalistic, they were intensely socialistic, uh, and they were very profoundly anti-Zionist because that was the, the, the recent event that had taken place. And I, if, when I go to Egypt today, I don't find an awful lot of people think that Nasser was a, was a fabulous, great guy, that he had a lot to offer. I think a lot of people feel that we're, we're still recovering from so many of the excesses of his revolution. So, you know, I, I, think, I think you pointed out a problem. You asked the question, how do we know that? The answer is, we don't know. But we do have a sense that, that there's a difference. The other difference that I think people should understand is that Egypt doesn't have a lot of oil and gas. Iran does. The Iranian revolution, quote, 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 is, is there and the regime is there because, because, of, because of oil. Because they have a huge source of money that keeps them going despite all the stupidities of their, of their economic management and everything else that they do. Egypt <clears throat> is not in the same position. They depend on tourism. They depend on access to the world. They depend on people coming to Egypt. They depend on greater openness. It's going to be much harder for Egypt to, to take another route. It would be, I mean, economically, even now, even after a month of this, they're having a terrible, they're going to have an increasingly difficult time. And so I think that's something that we have to sort of understand as we look at the Egyptian situation. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll just have these last two questions and then move to the book signing. Hi, Mr. Ray. Um, Hi. All of tonight, we were talking about um, constitutions and how this country's um, framework exists. But um, my question is that although we try to forget what's happened with Quebec over the last few decades, it's not something we can easily ignore. My question is that ever since Trudeau patriated the constitution in 1982, they still haven't signed it. We've had two um, accords, Meech Lake and Charlatan, which both failed. We um, had two referendums which didn't work. And the fact is that it still didn't work. So my question is, what will it take for Quebec to finally put the pen on the paper? Well, mm. <laughs> that's a great question. Mm. Uh, uh, I think you make it. I think you make a. I think you make a, make an excellent. I think you make an excellent point. Except to say that we say it doesn't work, but the Edmund Burke in me would say, well, actually, it does work. Uh, no formal document has been signed, but Quebec does not challenge the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, Quebecers live under the rule of law. They participate in our political system. They participate fully in our economic system. Uh, so the argument that says, well, the, you know, we have, we, we don't, we haven't resolved this question in a fully logical way, uh, but we have found a way to, to get along and to work our way through. Our constitutional odyssey isn't over. I could make the same argument with respect to First Nations and Aboriginal people. We have not fully recognized uh, who they are and who we are and how we connect to one another and how we move forward. Uh, so there's unfinished business in our Constitution. Um, and of that there is no doubt. However, having spent a good part of my, uh, the, the middle part or the first part or whatever part of my political career <laughs> involved in both Meech Lake and Charlottetown. I mean, I was a, a, a player in both those <laughs> events. Uh, I don't particularly want to go back to those swamps again because I, I think that they ultimately we found that it was just too, too difficult to make the changes that we need, we need to make. I hope it doesn't take a crisis to get there. I hope it doesn't take um, a, a confrontation to get there. And I'd like to think that we can find a way to, you know, reform the Senate, uh, engage, you know, successfully find the formula that will allow Quebec to say, yes, this is, this is fine. The, 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 but I'm, but I'm, I can't guarantee that will happen. The, the only other point I would make is, is that nobody should believe, nobody should believe that if and when we find the formula that allows the National Assembly to say, yes, this is it, that 
people will, there will still not be a group of people in Quebec who will say, we don't want, I mean, the Bloc Québécois does not want to reform the Canadian Constitution. Um, I'm not sure all of them want to, want to leave Canada either. I mean, it's quite complicated what people want. I think the best description is famous Quebec comedian Yvon Deschamps who said what we really want in Quebec is we want a fully independent Quebec in a united Canada. That's what we want. <laughs> and uh, I think there's a lot in that. I mean, that is sort of what people want. It's a dream. It, but it, 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 it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a very, what I think is interesting from, from the point of view of Canada in the world, which is part of what the book is about, is that we get asked a lot when we go overseas and we talk about federalism and they say, well, what about Quebec? And one of the problems we face is, is that there are a lot of countries that are very, very anti-federal that don't want federal model. And they say, the reason we don't want a federal model is we don't want a separatist movement. And my answer is, if we didn't have a federal model in Quebec, we wouldn't, in Canada, we wouldn't have Canada. Right. And I really believe that to be true. If we didn't have a working federation in this country in which we have found a way of accommodating each other, whether however imperfect it is, and it is imperfect, but if we hadn't been able to do that, we, we, would, we would have lost the country a long time ago. Final question. Uh, just a couple of comments. The, um, you talked about propping up some of these regimes. And I, I see what's happening in Egypt now, and there really is no real opposition. Well, that's partly because we've propped up a military dictatorship in many respects that's never been able to develop anything underneath it. So we have the situation where everybody wants change, but is there going to be a consensus to come up with something without, say, the Muslim brothers, maybe, coming up the center and taking over as some of the people worry about? And the other comment is that Israel has used Egypt as a bit of a scapegoat, as our friend, which hasn't allowed the Arabs really to come up with really a consensus what they want to do with Palestine and Israel. So maybe in some ways, a little bit of extra pressure on Israel, maybe they was the, the smart ones in Israel will say, yeah, we've got to have this state. We want to survive ourselves, as you said. Um, but when you have the uh, Iraq, uh, the Egyptian group, they're always being on their side, it somehow split the Arabs to coming up with a, a real consensus for where we, where we should go. And I think this may be an opportunity that the, um, the Arabs with a different leader, with some decent leadership maybe in Egypt, will come and with some new ideas of how to make Palestine and Israelis come together, knowing the Israelis say, hey, we've got to really work this out because now we're surrounded. They've really got to start to work with their, and create some friends, other friends in that area. Well, the, just to briefly, uh, I mean, the one thing I'd say about propping up, I mean, I, I think we, I don't think we should beat ourselves up quite as much as we tend to do. I mean, we're not propping up Colonel Gaddafi. I mean, Colonel Gaddafi has seized power and has taken power in his country of Libya. And I loved his comment when the, when the events were taking place in Tunisia and he was asked what he thought it was. He said, I, I think what's happening in Tunisia is a very bad idea, uh, which was not exactly a surprising thing for him to say. Um, there are a lot of bad governments in the world and there are a lot of authoritarian governments in the world and there are a lot of, of, uh, and, and it's not because we put, we didn't put them, the Canada didn't put them, the United States didn't put Colonel Gaddafi there. We didn't put Mubarak there. The army put Mubarak there. The Egyptian army decided that they had to get rid of the king and they had to modernize the country and they were the institution that was gonna, gonna, go, ahead and, go, gonna go ahead and do it. Now obviously uh, there's been a lot of events that have happened since then and there is a lot of American aid that's gone into Egypt and that's, that's all true. But I don't think it's just a matter of our propping them up. But your second point in that question, in the first question, is absolutely right. The problem with dictatorships, we saw it under the communists in, in Eastern Europe, and we see it in any other place, is it doesn't allow for the creation 
of other institutions and civil society, which is part of what a democracy is all about. Business groups, you know, trade unions, real trade unions, real business groups, real trade unions, real civil society groups, NGOs as we call them, all of the institutions of civil society, including political parties that are in opposition. And you've got to have that if you're going to have a working democracy. So yes, you're right. It's one of the things that's, that we're putting a lot of pressure on the Egyptians to say, well, come up with this quickly. So I have to say, guys, we really haven't had, we really haven't had a, an ability to do it. You know, there's over 20,000 political prisoners in Egypt. Um, it, it, it's worked on a very repressive, tough basis. That's how it's worked in terms of, of keeping people sort of off the street. And that's really what's, what's at stake.